Hello, and welcome back to Jolly Roger Hobbies. Today we're at a very special place, Quebec One. Now, Quebec One is a launch control facility, or LCF for short, controlling 10 nuclear missiles during the height of the Cold War. This facility was decommissioned in 2005 and has now been opened up to the public as a museum. Today, we get to tour that facility including the underground capsule that was protected from a nuclear strike, ensuring what was called mutual destruction. Basically, you launch your missiles, we'll launch ours. This is what the Cold War was all about. So join me as we take this historic tour, coming to you in 40 seconds or less. Here on my channel, I do videos on general hobbies, which include model building, RC aircraft, planes, helicopters, etc., video games like Star Citizen, photography, geocaching, anything to do with aviation, and I also do product reviews. I put links to items that I showcase in my videos in the description, so be sure to check that out. Be sure to like the video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll see when I upload a new video. Also, feel free to ask questions in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer. And feel free to converse with one another, but please do it in a respectful way. Behind me is the LCF Quebec 1, which controlled 10 launch facilities, or LFs, located up to 10 miles away. But you probably know them as missile silos. In each silo sat a single nuclear missile, in each missile sat 10 individual nuclear warheads capable of striking up to 10 different targets simultaneously. Now Quebec 1 is located in Wyoming, just 28 miles north of Cheyenne as the crow flies and just south of Chugwa. It is exit 39 off of Interstate 25 and just a stone's throw away from the interstate making this an easy accessible stop on your trip. So please come by and visit this historical site. I would like to take this time to dedicate this video to all the members of the armed services and all those who have served or are serving. But specifically, I would like to acknowledge and dedicate this video to a very special person, my father, Tech Sergeant Harold Wayne Johnson, United States Air Force, retired. He was assigned to the 90th Security Police Group 90th Missile Squadron, Flight 2, and during three separate tours, spent a total of 13 hard-working, dedicated years out here guarding these LCFs and LFs. It was his responsibility to keep these sites like this one safe from all invaders, terrorists, sabotages, and spies alike, foreign and domestic. And he did that job well, spending a lot of time away from his family to protect the United States of America, to protect me and our way of life. Always willing to give the ultimate sacrifice, his life, for that cause. I, at the time, knew none of this. I just knew Daddy was gone all the time. I was a very small child at that time. I know now, and I'm here to see what his life was like during that time. In his service... He stepped foot on every single LCF and LF controlled by F.E. Warren Air Force Base, which had missile sites in Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado. And yes, he ate, slept, and guarded this very site. We are about to take a tour. So let's get to it. All right, here we are on the outside of the LCF, which in later terms will be known as a MAF. Um, there is some wind out here. It is Wyoming, so I do apologize if uh, any of this comes across the mic. I do have the uh, windsock on, so I hope that's going to cut down on some of it. Um, let me just pan around real quick and show you. There isn't much out here. We're just north of Cheyenne and south of Chokewater. As you can see right over there in the distance, which isn't too far, that's the interstate. That's how close we are. And then that big concrete pad right there is a landing pad for helicopters. So anybody coming out in the field. So, here would be the parking lot. And again, 
what I refer to and it has in past times was the LCF for launch control facility. Now normally standing right here we would be greeted by security forces ask what the heck we're doing but of course this is now a museum. So if you could ignore the cars put yourself back in the time period of the Cold War. My father was stationed here and every single LCF and LF around. So imagine being a maintenance worker, security forces, or even the capsule crew. You would come down this road, you would be in a suburban. It's how they transferred missile crews, security forces, everything. Everybody, maintenance personnel. And you come right here to this gate. As you see on the sign, 400th Missile Squadron, Quebec 1, Chugwater, Wyoming. At this gate is where you'd have to present all credentials to get onto this facility. Immediately on the left is the uh, maintenance shack. The big door in the middle is where they park a front end loader. And then you'd have uh, your uh, military vehicles, security vehicles, maintenance vehicles, anything needed to be garage. You had a parking lot over here. And we'll get to another parking lot over there, and we'll get to that white thing in a minute. Come over here, these two big brown things are the vent tubes. This is where all the fresh air and recycled air and vent air comes from the capsule. The capsule is directly below these tubes. Well, part of the capsule is. And you'll notice that later on in the tour. That white looking thing is an antenna or multiple antennas inside that. That was designed so if need be, an orbiting aircraft could launch all the missiles without this site being here. Or if the capsule crews became incapacitated for some reason, the orbiting aircraft could send a signal down here and operate all the missiles. So right here, this is where you go into the front door. This is the main entrance area. And you see this side. So as we walk in the door here, so the first thing you see would be the FSC's office, which is the Flight Security Controller's office. Now normally, this door would be closed during operation. And you have to present full credentials again just to get in this room. After presenting your credentials to get in the facility, you'll end up coming down this hallway first. Now for the museum purposes, this shows you the type of people that served here.
And this is where you're greeted when you come into the museum. This would be your main entertainment hall. And the people serving here would use this room to receive phone calls. You can see they even had a pool table right here for you. This is where the main security and operations crew stayed. And these boards show you what life was like during this time. As we come down the hallway right here, make our first right, this was the dining area. And my father sat in this very room eating his foil packs. Make a left right here, this is the kitchen area. This is where the kitchen, where the cook prepared meals like soup, warmed up the foil packs, prepared them for all the crew. The cook was a very special person. If you got a good cook, you treated him well. Because all your meals came from him. And see a TV up there for the personnel to watch during their rec times. And as I said, my father sat in this very room to eat his foil packs. And the one thing he did tell me is that of all the foil packs he tried, and he tried all of them, his favorite was Salisbury steak with rice. And he ate that every meal, lunch and dinner. And breakfast, he'd get eggs to order from this very kitchen. Then we come back out here, we come down this hallway into the living spaces. So immediately on our left, we have the bathroom for the crew. Showers. And toilets. This is where the crew took care of all their personal hygiene. Then almost right across is what was called the transients room. And in here is where people who traveled here would stay. Maintenance crews, security forces, or in my dad's time they were called security police. You have a bunk and a desk. And then come into this room. This was the flight security controller's room. Here we have another little restaurant. I'm assuming this one would have been for female crews. Of course, in my dad's time, there was no female crews. So that might have been the uh, FSM's bath personal bathroom. bedroom down here, which 
which was reserved for female security forces. Again, when they were allowed on site. And in case any of you are wondering what this plaque says, this talks about how this facility came to be. So please pause the video and read it if you like. And then back out. So coming in the FSC's office, now to get in this office you had to present a whole bunch of all your security clearances, forms, orders, everything to even get in here. So, this was the whole office. And behind this door, is the door to the elevator that leads down into the LCC or Launch Control Center, also known as the capsule. Intercept missiles. The missiles are spread out across the plains in their silos. They start off in the north with Quebec 02. They go around clockwise to Quebec 11. The top site facility, its only job is to keep security on those 10 sites. If there's anything wrong with the missiles where they need to be maintained or they need to be checked on, they will have to call back to base and base will send out a missile maintenance crew. These security forces members will still meet them out there as they have to keep complete control over those sites at all times. Especially if the silo gets open, there will be a small squad of people out there arming or guarding that site. The names on the wall behind me, these are all former Missileers, FM, FSC officers, uh, security forces members, pretty much anyone that was here when they shut the site down in 2005. If this was an active site, the uh, FM or the facility manager would have to come down here and scrub all this off or paint over it as the Air Force is very much not about people graffitiing their stuff. <laughs> You guys would stay behind the yellow line for a second. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can come out, just this yellow line. This door is to remain closed for most of the day. The only times it would be open really is if there's a missile ear change in crew, um, if the missile ears were receiving food from the chef upstairs, or if the uh, facility manager needed to come down and check something in the equipment room. Usually they would try to do that during the missile ear changes, that way you don't have to wake somebody up inside to come open the door for you. On the back side of this door we have the official, unofficial uh, morale patch of the 90th. Uh, this is the Jolly Roger, or the Skull and Cross Bombs. It came about World War II when the 90th was actually a bomb squad, or bomb group. Uh, they were stationed in the Philippines. They, uh, uh, Captain Rogers came up with the design, they uh, cut it out of a stencil and then start tagging just about anything they get their hands on, mostly their planes though. It's just an identifier mark so you know whose squad or whose uh, group you're supposed to be in when you're in the sky. So going into the next room, please watch your step. So this is the tunnel junction. This is just the center of the capsule. The best way to visualize the capsule is it looks like a giant circus peanut. It's bulge on both sides and then skinny in the center. This room just connects the equipment room with the launch control center and also holds the missile ears water tank. Uh, there's also a larger water tank on the outside of the capsule. Uh, we don't know how big it is. That's one of their secrets that they like to keep to themselves. That is because they are still using these capsules all around the country for their for the defense. Uh, we'll go into the equipment room now.
Um, luckily, this one didn't have that big of a problem with it, so we don't usually check on it. But so everything inside this room is here to run the capsule over there. If the power were to shut off, this generator over here would automatically kick on. This generator only runs electronics down here. There's also another generator upstairs that runs the top side facility. And then there is a generator at each one of the launch facilities. That is so if we were ever attacked and the, they took the power out, uh, they could still continue their mission and launch the missiles. It was actually a very big concern as there is a silo right behind the Wheatland power plant. The silo was there first, so talk to the power plant about why they put it there. Um, on either side of me, sorry, this is the intake, that's the exhaust. When you're coming on the site, you probably saw the two uh, red or maroon top hats. Those are the vents, that's where these lead to. Inside these vents are blast valves. The blast, blast valves are being held, electrically held open. As soon as they receive no more electricity, they slam themselves shut, and it seals off the air down here. Once they are shut, they, the missileers only have about three months of air to live on and about that much in food, so you have to make your decision if you want out or not. When the valves are open, the air is sucked down here and is pushed into this room in here in the corner. This is the clean room or the brine chiller. Inside this room, there's a bunch of different uh, filters and it takes out any contaminants in the air and then cools it down as much as possible. Once that is done, or once it is cooled down, it is then forced over into the capsule site. Once over there, it is then pushed around all the computer components. That is because they're very old, they're not very efficient. They generate quite a bit of heat. They have to constantly keep them cool to keep them running. Uh, so the floor that we're standing on is actually a false floor, dead spot. We're being suspended off the ground by these 12 shock isolators, these red things on the wall. There's three powered shock isolators. They're just here to keep, uh, just for if there's any seismic activity or if a bomb were to drop anywhere near here, things inside this room would stay on their feet. Mostly those cabinets back there in the corner, as everything else seems to have a pretty wide base on it, it would take quite a bit to get them to knock over. Uh, any questions so far? All right, so in 2005, when the, when the Air Force deactivated this squadron, they came into these capsules and they took everything out with them. If it wasn't well to the ground and some things that were, it got taken away and either sold for scrap or uh, used at another facility. One of the, and when they were coming, when they started bringing things back, they realized they didn't have enough to go around, so we're missing quite a few things out of our capsule. One of the things was in this dark spot back here. It uh, was the hydraulic control panel for the blast valves. That was so you could manually open and close them. Um, Usually you'd only do that if you were absolutely required to, because I have heard from Miss Lears that it was quite a pain to get them to open up again. Another thing that we were missing would have sat in this corner here. This is a diesel tank. You do, uh, the Miss Lears and the FM would come down to make sure that they had enough diesel to run their mission and to make sure that the diesel was clean enough to run the generators. You don't want to run dirty diesel through your generators or they won't work that well. Um, any other questions? All right, we will move on to the more exciting side. So, this is Quebec's mural. Many of the missile alert facilities had a mural of some type. These are usually painted by airmen that were stationed out here. You've got to give them something constructive to do so they're not writing their names on the wall. Um, this is actually a much smaller and more tamed one than, but, than most of them that are around. The other ones that I've seen pictures of, there's a Grim Reaper coming up the side of the capsule coming out of the door. There's an aquatic scene all the way up the elevator shaft. And then another one, there's a dragon coming down. Also at one of the Minuteman Missile Museums, on the back of their blast door, they have the Domino's logo with uh, 30 minutes or less and your next missile's free. <laughs> uh, this also says that it's a show place of the 90th. That is because this is where the base would send any kind of VIPs, dignitaries, statesmen, anybody that had authorization to come and view one of these places, this is usually where they would send them. That is because we're so close to base, you can get them sent out here, check them in, show them around, and then send them back, and it won't take all day. This also hints back to the origin with the, of the 90th with its bombs, or bomber group. Uh, this is the nose of the Liberator. That was their plane that they were issued in World War II. 
It also has Daffy Duck about to squash the Soviet bear. So this is the second glass door. This is an eight-ton glass door. This door was to be shut for most of the day. That is because if this door is open, one of the missileers have, or if this door is open, both of the missileers have to be awake and alert. If the door is closed, one of the missileers could take their six to eight hours of sleep. You ran 24-hour alerts down here, and uh, the Air Force allowed you about six to eight hours if you could find the time. Some days were busier than others. On the back side of this door, we have the 400th Missile Squadron official patch. This is the it has the 10 MIRVs coming out of the sky. The MIRVs are the multiple independently retargetable vehicles. Those are the warheads. The reason the Peacekeeper is so special is because it could hold 10 warheads on a single missile compared to the Minuteman III that could only hold three warheads on a single missile. This also has the no loam zone, two-person concept mandatory sticker. That meant when this place was active, if you were ever caught in this room by yourself, it was an automatic court-martial and kicked out of the Air Force. They foresee no reason you should ever be in these rooms by yourself. That is due to the classified information that is stored inside these rooms and all the computer components. They don't want anybody trying to sabotage their mission. So, going into the capsule, please watch your head. <laughs> So this is Quebec's Launch Control Center. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, no matter what is going on in the world, there is always two people stationed down here ready to go. The deputy commander would have sat in this chair. Their job is to take care of all the communication equipment that was in these three racks. We're missing a lot of it because it was classified information. As soon as it left the building, it was either destroyed or automatically taken to another facility for use. The other job of the deputy commander is to take care of all the computer readouts that are in, in these three racks. We're missing a lot of the drawers that should have been here for the peacekeeper, um, so we are missing some of the printer readouts, at least two of them. Um, down here, this is uh, the commander's console. The commander's job is to sit and monitor the missiles. Uh, these panels light up, uh, the, the panels light up, the lights correspond to different things happening to the missile. Of course, the missileers know exactly what each one of the lights mean. They also would have gotten any security alerts down here. There's an inner and outer zone on each one of the launch facilities. The outer zone is anywhere around the fence and within the fenced-in area. The inner zone is on top of the silo. Somebody's trying to get through the door. The outer zone could honestly be set off by just about anything. Uh, tumbleweed, mice, jackrabbit, antelope, cows brushing up against the fence. But no matter what, you always have to treat every single alarm as if there's somebody there trying to take a nuke out of the, out of the silo. Um, so uh, the missileers started putting these plexiglass pieces over the top of these so they can write themselves notes, mo mainly to remind themselves that a um, uh, silo is being maintained that day. If you get your orders to launch, you would have to call them, tell them to start getting their stuff and get out of there, and also take their key with them. When the, missile, or when the maintenance crews go to the silos, once they get inside, one of the computers there has a key slot that they stick their key into and it disables that silo completely from being used. So if they leave and don't take their key with them, then, it, then, they, uh, then that silo is completely worthless to everybody. Uh, if the missileers were down here, if they got stuck and they could not escape or get out through the um, elevator shaft, the only other way out of here is through this escape hatch that's up here in the corner. It's also affectionately called the deputy killer. That is because it was the deputy's job to open it. That tunnel runs off at an angle. It stops just five feet below the surface. It is completely packed with sand. So they dubbed it the killer because if you opened it up and you didn't get out of the way in time, it would come down and hit you on the head and then you're not having a good day. Um, some missileers have sat down and speculated that there's actually more sand inside that tunnel than there is space inside this capsule. So you'd actually 
effectively be burying yourself trying to get out. Uh, other missileers have feared that if there is a nuclear bomb anywhere dropped anywhere near here, the heat from the blast would actually turn that sand into glass and then you're really stuck down here. But more practically, this place was built in the 60s. Uh, there's been a lot of renovations upstairs. That tunnel's supposed to come out somewhere behind the garage, but uh, some missileers now fear that it actually comes out underneath the parking lot, or the joke is underneath the sewer lagoon. <laughs> So if the missileers were to receive their um, receive their orders, they would receive them over the EWO frequency or their emergency war order frequency. Both missileers receive it in their radio sets. They all, the deputy will also receive it on every communication device down here. So once you start receiving your orders, you are to come sit down, strap yourself in. The deputy will do the same thing and start sliding back and forth on these rails. That is because it's the deputy's job to start checking each one of the communication devices to make sure that they all come out exactly the same and that there had not been an order beforehand that superseded this order. Um, once they, uh, The message that would come out of the radios would sound something like Alpha, Bravo, Tango, Charlie, Seven, Foxtrot, something along those lines. Um, the missileers will sit down, they'll write down each one of the letters and numbers that come out. The message will repeat itself. Once that's done, they will then check with each other to make sure that the, that the message that they received was the same. After that is confirmed, they'll stand up, they'll come over here to this red code safe. Inside this code safe is two keys and a book of codes. Inside the message you just received, that tells you which codes you need to be looking at. You'll take the codes and one key to your seat, strap yourself back in. You'll then take the codes and snap them in half. They're inside a plastic uh, wafer card, or they called it the cookie. You'd pull the piece of paper out that's inside the card, um, start checking to make sure that the codes you just pulled out are the same as the message you just received. If they are, that's your signal to start arming the missile. To arm the missile is a long process. Um, it's quite a long checklist. Missileers are very proficient at it. There's a reason they call them the Minute Man is because they would be ready to launch within a minute or within minutes. Um, uh, so <laughs> once they're done with that checklist, the deputy commander will stick their key into this slot, the key slot. The commander will stick their key into the right side of their console there. After that is done, they will then wait for another message. That message will either tell them to stand down or to launch. If it is to launch, they will go through another short checklist. They will then have a short countdown between the two missileers. Once that is finished, um, once that is finished, they will. Uh, they will. <laughs> once that countdown is at the end, they will both turn their keys at the same time. They have to do it within a fraction of a second of each other, or the computer does not register that they voted. Each missile is one vote. You need four votes to actually launch missiles from the ground. So another capsule somewhere else in the squadron has to do the same procedure and vote at the same time. They don't have to be exactly the same time as these guys, but they have to be around the same time. If for whatever reason none of the capsules in the squadron can get their message out to launch, there's always a plane in the sky called the looking glass. In that plane, there's two missileers. Those two missileers have complete control over all the missile fields in all of the U.S. If they get the orders to launch, they can start launching. They do not have to wait for another two people to vote. And with, uh, uh, with those two missileers, they also have the ability to cancel any launch orders. If they see that somebody's trying to launch, launch missiles without, uh, without be given the orders to, they, will, they can stop them from doing that. So on the outside of this key slot, we have the United States Air Force uh, quality seal, I call it. Uh, these seals would have been on each one of these drawers and anything else in here that you could possibly open up and start tinkering with on your own. Uh, this was so; These were so that one missileer could sleep. Once you were done with your sleep, you had to stand up and start walking around checking all of these, making sure that none of them had been messed with. If you did notice one that had been messed with, you'd have to call back to base they would start an investigation against the two missileers down here. They have to know why that drawer was opened. Um, uh, before they came out with these seals, they actually required the missileers to stay awake for their entire 24-hour alert down here. You were provided a bed to lay on, that's it. If you were caught sleeping, you were in big trouble. Have heard stories of both missileers falling asleep down here with the door closed. They, uh, the crew upstairs found out somehow they tried to help them out by coming down and banging on the door 
They uh, called from upstairs. They even sent some security forces members out to the silos to check to make or to start messing around with the alarms. They still didn't wake up. Once they did wake up, they were sent back to base. They were court-martialed and kicked out of the Air Force. Uh, sleeping is one thing that they will not, they do not take lightly. Everything else, if you mess up with anything on the procedure of any checklist, if they, and they find out about it, they will just take you out of rotation, send you back to class, and you have to learn everything all over again. They want you to be 100% proficient down here so they don't have to worry about you. But sleeping is one of those that they cannot train you again. They could not train you on, so you're, that's the end of your career in the missile field. Um, so funny story about these seals. They actually had to start putting them over the key slots because some missileers were sitting down here and getting so bored, they're breaking their pencil lead off in the key slots. Then the Air Force would have to come down and start uh, and replace the keys. They got sick of that. They decided they were going to get people in trouble if they keep doing that. Uh, another reason they came out with these seals is because they were, they uh, towards the end before they came out with these, um, they were lo losing a lot of their top people because they were caught sleeping. So they decided they needed to figure out a better way to deal with this than to just fire them. Uh, so just like the the equipment room, we we. Yeah. We are being suspended in the center of this capsule, or the center of the cement, being held up by these four shock isolators. These are pneumatic shock isolators. Currently we have them shut off and the whole thing is on blocks because they're very finicky. If you were to get two missileers on the same side or in the same corner looking at something, they would slowly start tilting the capsule that way and you'd spend the rest of your day trying to get it back to flat. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, so to uh, combat the boredom that most missileers get down here, the Air Force allows you to do just about anything within the confines of this space. Uh, the newer capsules actually have an exercise bike somewhere outside. Um, that is so you can get a little exercise while you're sitting down here, get your blood pumping. Uh, many missileers actually choose to use this time to study for advanced degrees. They'll get their masters in different things. Um, whatever they're interested in. It does not have to be anything mi military related. But uh, if you didn't feel like doing either one of those, there was a TV above this console. That TV is connected to the TV upstairs. So if you get a, if you get a missile ear, uh, or if you get a airman sitting up there flipping through channels, you're sitting down here flipping through channels. <laughs> uh, uh, our capsule was actually a little unique because they actually had a VHS player in the capsule with them. That was usually one of the things that was upstairs. You would have to arrange with the facility manager beforehand and tell them what movie you'd want and what time you wanted it on. That way you're not calling at 3 in the morning try telling somebody to turn the movie on. Um, another funny story, I have heard that if uh, for some reason the missileers made the crew upstairs mad or the crew upstairs just didn't like one of the missileers, They'd actually change the channel to a Hallmark or a Lifetime and then lock it and leave it for the rest of the day. That's all you get to watch. Uh, any questions? So each each missile was silo was controlled independently. No, they were all they so all were controlled. Uh, ten of them were controlled from here. Oh, then okay. there's five there's five uh, missile alert facilities in each squadron. Um, so each one of those uh, takes care of ten. So there's 50 in this squadron alone. Um, so yeah, so and then, so this one's deactivated. The 319th, 320th, and 321st are still active. They're in Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska. Those guys, um, those ones, there's at least 150 silos uh, divided between those three. Wow. So when they would turn their keys, would they all the silos that they control, would they all launch or could they go? Uh, actually, from here, you can actually launch all of the missiles within your squadron. And with the Peacekeeper, so originally with the Minuteman 3, they only allowed you to control the or control or look at five the other five masts in your squadron. Well, they originally planned to have 100 Peacekeeper missiles in the ground, so they actually were going to start, they were actually... Um, if this was the correct drawer for here, there would be another five, uh, uh, another five sites to be able to select, and from here you could actually launch all of, all hundred missiles. Um, but they decided that that was a waste of money. They were going to figure out another way to base them, so uh, 
they put 50 down in the ground, they're going to do something else with the next 50, then the Soviet Union collapsed and that was all just a waste of money. Alright, so if there's no more questions, you guys can take pictures and we will head off to the elevator. So when when they um, when they redo the missiles moving forward, are we hoping to get some of that classic equipment back as the missile systems modernized? Um, we put down here. Somewhat, they actually have gone gone completely away from this. Even during Peacekeeper time, they stopped doing the two consoles. Mm -hmm. They're down to a single console. It's called the React system. Both missile ears are sitting right next to each other, so you don't have to, this sliding back and forth stuff. Um, but no, uh, yes and no. They'll most likely most of the stuff that we do need is still being used, so they won't they won't give it up unless it's absolutely not needed anymore. So up here would be the escape hatch. Right through there, which would fill the entire capsule with sand, possibly. Here's where the TV would be. And one of the large shock absorbers. And here's the one bed that was mentioned. And as you can see, the one toilet. Yeah, so uh, on the side of here, that's where all the hex cables come in. They go into like, um, oh, they're like resistors, but they're big metal boxes mm -hmm. and it either uh, turns down the signal or turns it back up mm -hmm. with depending on which way the signal's going. Oh, okay. How close are we to the actual missile silos? Uh, minimum of five miles. Um, there's two of them that are just within the five miles. So well, there's none right here on no. this location. This no. is just a control. Thank you.